It is the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Welcome to Successful Dropout. This podcast is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those that dare to dream and act on their dreams. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join me as we find out what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed as an entrepreneur. What's up, Successful Dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have Jonathan Lacoste. Jonathan is the COO and co-founder of Jebit, a digital marketing platform focused on post-click engagement, allowing marketers to create mobile, interactive content. He was also the youngest person on the Forbes 30 Under 30 2015 list. He's been a guest speaker at numerous events and conferences, including Adweek Europe and North America, Digiday's Agency Summit, the NAB Digital Future Summit, and 4A's Transformational Summit. In his spare time, Jonathan is also a frequent marathon runner. So Jonathan, that's the intro I have for you, man, but tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Thanks so much, Kylon. Appreciate uh, you having me on today. Uh, yeah, I grew up in uh, Cleveland, Ohio originally. Uh, went to school there. Uh, was a big hockey player growing up and uh, ended up going to school at Boston College um, out in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and so, as you mentioned, kind of picked up the marathon running um, once I went to college and uh, started to mess around with the business plan competition with a couple of friends there. Really got into this idea of entrepreneurship and startups, um, a really kind of vibrant startup ecosystem here in Boston between Harvard, MIT, Boston College, and everything else going on with uh, Google and Facebook in town. It was right. uh, just kind of an incredible environment that captured my attention as soon as I got here. And so, Jebit, I, I, tell me a little bit more about Jebit and what exactly you do. Absolutely. So I think the fun thing that anyone with a startup that's listening will know is that uh, you go through a couple of different iterations if you've been at it long enough, right? So we've been, <laughs> we've been at Jebit for five years now. What Jebit first was when we first started in college, um, it was a website where college students only could log into Jebit.com and answer questions um, to be paid cash by brands, right? Um, not a, a super interesting business at all, but that was the first idea, and it's kind of what we started working on. So just to gather like market research, that sort of thing. Exactly. Yep. It was all about market research for big brands and proving that you know we could get college students to interact in a certain way. And getting college students in 2011 to interact with big brands was still very difficult. There was no Snapchat. There was no Instagram. Facebook ad products and Twitter ad products were practically non-existent. Um, so as crazy as it sounds today, it was actually more difficult back then to just be in front of college kids. Right. Um, so that was the value then. I won't, I won't bore you with kind of all the iterations we've gone through, but for the last two years, we finally have kind of arrived at this marketing software platform we've created where really big brands and companies will use our technology to create mobile interactive content. So if any of you have been on Tinder or Snapchat Discover before and you kind of see how you can swipe through different people or you can kind of click and expand and see those full immersive experiences, we power that for brands like Mazda, New Balance, different professional sports teams. And so they will use our technology as a part of their digital uh, media and marketing. Oh, okay. I see. So if I am any kind of digital marketer, how do I interact with Jebit then? So you would work with our team to create different content experiences. So let's say you are a digital marketer at Mazda and you are trying to sell cars, right? And you're trying to introduce owners across the country to the new 2017 Mazda lineup of vehicles. Um, you would use Jebit to create an interactive mobile experience so that when you get an email from Mazda or maybe you see a post online on Facebook about Mazda, once you click on that, you're going to be brought through you know, kind of maybe the swiping experience where it tries to find the best Mazda for you depending on how you interact. Um, or maybe it'll try and teach you about the most interesting features depending on what you think is most interesting. So it's this idea that in the mobile world where we all have really short attention spans and we expect everything to be personalized to us, we don't have the patience to kind of run through static content uh, anymore. We like things that are kind of personalized to us and we find that interactive content does that really nicely. 
Okay, so for instance, say now I'm a consumer and I'm looking to buy a car. I see like an ad from Mazda and I click on that. Maybe I'm filling out like a like a quiz or something like that. It could be a quiz, yeah. I think the idea is that, um, especially with car buying, it's a very complicated process and very few people know instantly what they want to buy, right? Mm. There are a lot Mm -hmm. of factors you have to weigh. A lot of the times you want kind of like a professional recommendation or you want to look at all of your options. Um, And so, frankly, the car buying experience of just going online and kind of flipping through landing pages or the Mazda website and kind of comparing things um, isn't necessarily as helpful as... If you go to a car dealership and someone is there kind of, you know, holding your hand, answering all your questions, pointing out the best vehicles based on your interests and concerns, Jebit is the digital version of that. Oh, okay. That, that's interesting. That really puts it in perspective because I know for me personally, um, and this is tough because I do some digital, ha- have to do some digital marketing myself, but, you know, I go to certain websites or, st- you know, usually I'm trying to avoid the ads, right? And so... So that that's interesting that you're kind of putting a more of an interactive spin on it and, and engaging the consumer more. I like that. Totally. We're all bombarded by way too many ads online. Um, and in fact, most of us aren't even clicking on them now. And so where most of our partners and digital marketers will use Jebit is, you know, Kylan, you have a social following. <clears throat> if you're on posting about Twitter and you're trying to get new subscribers to the show, the focus might be, you know, why should you? Um, want to listen to the successful dropout as opposed to just getting people immediately to sign up. You have to share that exciting story. And so for your podcast, it's really interesting. But when people are thinking about insurance or financial services or shoes, it sometimes (laughs) isn't as interesting. So that's what we do. (laughs) Interesting. What a cool model. So you obviously dropped out of school at some point. It's why you're on the show. So I'd love you to tell us that story. Absolutely. Um, So I dropped out of Boston College at the very beginning of 2013. Um, I had just completed my third semester there. Um, My co-founder was, both my co-founders were uh, seniors at the time. So they were entering their last semester of college, actually. Um, We had been running Jebit for over a year from our dorm rooms and spare classrooms. And so what I mean by that is, you know, pretty much every night and every weekend, Uh, We were meeting uh, between the three of us, and we had also recruited a bunch of our friends. We had a group of about 15 of us at one point, um, all meeting once a week to kind of do various things. Three or four of the technical folks would, you know, meet separately and try and hack, uh, you know, the product or the website together. A few of us would go and, you know, try and get college kids to sign up for the website because that was the business at the time. And others would go and focus on selling the brands to get people to answer questions about you. Um, And long story short, we ended up having an opportunity to apply to a couple of accelerators, Y Combinator, Techstars, et cetera. Um, We got denied the first few times. And to be honest, I'm glad we did because we certainly weren't ready. Um, But we finally got accepted to um, Techstars Boston. And so Techstars, for those that aren't familiar uh, with it, is very much like a lot of the other accelerator programs. Um, But at the time, it was you know probably and still is one of the top three accelerators here in the States. Um, so it was a really prestigious uh, you know, experience. We were super lucky and excited to be a part of it. Um, but it is you know, 100 hours a week you're working. You're living there. We, when we joined Techstars, I basically lived out of that office, to be honest. So um, there was absolutely no way we could do school and that at the same time. Um, so we were actually very fortunate where we were kind of presented with this immediate opportunity where it became very clear if we didn't leave school, we were going to have to miss this Techstars opportunity. Um, so for us, and even my co-founders that were seniors, um, it became a decision that wasn't taken lightly by any means, but we realized that if we decided to pass on this, we were most likely passing on the chance to grow Jebit into something larger. And so we decided that at that moment, it was uh, worth the risk of, of leaving and so we left school. And so at that point, how old was, was Jebit? Like one or two years old? It was 12 months old, but I, I, I don't even, you know, 
and it was being worked on on the side, right? So <laughs> I think about if, if we were doing it full time for three months, we probably made about as much progress as we did in 12 months on the side. So, right. um, you know, it was still very much in the infancy stage of uh, where we were at as a, uh, as a company. I see. Okay. So I'm curious, what was, what was the birth of, of Jebit at the very, very beginning? Kind of what sparked that original idea to get college students to sign up to answer questions, stuff like that? So it's funny, it actually goes back to the conversation we were just having where you and I were both talking about how much we like online advertising. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was the inspiration. So it was actually uh, my co-founder who was watching a Hulu TV show um, and, you know, a 30-second pre-roll video ad appeared and uh, we, we would always open up a new tab and go to Facebook basically completely ignoring that ad as it played for 30 seconds, you know, check, right. check a, a few friends are doing, maybe grab a snack, go to the bathroom and then come back and watch your show. Right. This was before the skip button was there. And when we started to do research, I think because we weren't from the online advertising industry, we were shocked to know how much money was wasted each year on that particular area of online advertising. And that was just one. Billions of dollars are wasted by people completely ignoring online ads. And then you have those display ads that are popping up all around. And, you know, as we did more and more research, we realized, wow, there's a huge opportunity here to actually get consumers to engage with the content of brands in a way that is meaningful. And that has always been the mission of Jebit. It's always been about how can we get consumers to engage content in a more thoughtful, thorough manner where they actually walk away more educated and informed, whether that's about a political candidate, a brand, or their friend. And the way we just started and the easiest way to start was, well, let's throw up a website and have them answer questions about a few brands. You know, let's hmm. see if they retain anything off of that. Um, so that was kind of the original inspiration and in, in what got us started. Yeah, love, love those stories about that first inspirational kind of spark you know, that it just ignites a, a, a larger company now. Um, were, were you generating much revenue for that those first 12 months then at all while you were still in school? We had probably done under just under $100,000 in, in 12 months, the, the 18 months there, um, which to us at the time was like, holy crap, you know, we're making it rain. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it, it was basically just a bunch of uh, college students um, hustling, startups, mobile apps. You know, we sold a few larger brands on you know thousand dollar, five hundred dollar campaigns to you know advertise on our website. Was basically what we were selling at the time. Was your was the Jebit group kind of interacting with any other groups at the school at the time that were doing similar startups or anything like that? Or were you guys kind of uh, more isolated in that way? You know, I would say a little bit of both, to be honest. Um, one of the things that really helped us at BC was there was this professor and this new program called Tech Trek. And it was basically this idea that they wanted to take students at Boston College and give them real life experiences by bringing them to venture capital firms, to you know, well-funded startups so that they could meet founders and kind of begin to see and understand what that goes on in that ecosystem. So I, as a freshman, as soon as I got there, I got introduced to this program. And so every Friday afternoon, you know, when your friends are you know, playing video games or starting to booze it up, we would go downtown Boston and visit, you know, the Google offices and answer, you know, ask questions to their execs and hear about what they're doing. We would go to, you know, Wayfair, which is another huge uh, Amazon-like company here in Boston, HubSpot, which is in our, our space. They do marketing software. So that type of, uh, you know, transparency from those extremely influential and smart individuals at such a young age in, in my college career was definitely informative. And, and anyone that's in entrepreneurship knows when you get the entrepreneurship bug, it's hard to you know, turn it off and, <laughs> and, and move on to something else. Right. So that definitely fueled it. But at the same time, Jebit was one of the first startups to really be you know, started at Boston College. And so it was one of the struggles that we were figuring out because a lot of professors and, and the administration and other students didn't really know how to deal with us, frankly, right? This was still new. This wasn't something where everyone was starting a company right, right. out of their dorm room. Like, it seems like people are today. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you got this incredible opportunity with the accelerator and you got, you decided to take it. How did um, the rest of your friends and especially your family react to you dropping out then? Well, it was one of those things where I think 
I've, I've made many, many mistakes and can, will continue to do so. Um, I think that's you know, what being an entrepreneur is all about. Yeah. But one of the things that I got advice early on to do that I, looking back I still wouldn't change is I kept my parents very much in the loop the entire Jevit experience. Mm. And so you know, let's just say that I don't think it came as a rapid surprise to them when I approached them and said, hey, I'm actually going to be leaving school. Um, because they had kind of seen this build up. I think if the communication wasn't as transparent, it would have come out of left field and just been a diff- difficult conversation. Doesn't mean I wouldn't have still left. Uh, both my parents are in education, so it wasn't <laughs> an easy conversation anyways because <laughs> right. of, the, of the value that they placed there. Yeah. Um, but I think because of the fact that, you know, hey, mom, you know, we just uh, signed this angel investor. It's only 15K, but that's a really big deal. Um, you know, hey, you know, we just beat our goal for, you know, revenue this semester. Uh, we were still tracking revenue on semesters at that time, <laughs> as opposed to quarters. Um, you know, and, and just kind of giving them s- the sprinkling in the good news every now and then um, allowed them to get behind this and really understand the opportunity and all the work that had been put in um, so that it wasn't as abrasive when I approached them. Yeah, and that's a successful dropout. So that's just a key point that I want to bring out there, Jonathan, that you said at the beginning, which is you communicated. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And that's something I brought up um, on the Fast Advice Friday um, this last week. Is uh, It's so important when talking to your parents about the possibility or, or your decision that you've made to drop out that you've, just, you've been communicating the entire time um, because it just makes things so much more transparent and uh, it doesn't leave things up to um, interpretation that could be could be wrong or negative. So, Jonathan, now for anybody who's who maybe doesn't have parents that support them um, as much as yours did, what advice would you have for them on how to uh, you know best handle that situation when, when dropping out with their with their friends and family? Well, I think one of the things that I've talked to a lot of other startup founders that have been in those types of situations, and the conclusion we always come to is that um, there's there's no risk in trying if you agree to a defined limit, right? I think the term dropping out is so polarizing at times, and, and parents, um, you know, to answer your question, have such a negative connotation because it, it's viewed as you're never going back, you know, and, and, and what happens if this doesn't work out? Um, I think you just have to approach it from the perspective of, okay, this is the opportunity. This is what I want to accomplish with all of the extra time I now have. These are the goals I'm going to set and the progress I would like to make. This is the timeline I'm going to do this in, you know, six months, three months, you know. And if I don't, if we don't come close to that at all, you know, I might miss it by a little because it's going to take time to learn my industry and build a product and sell customers. So it always takes longer than you think. But if I don't even come close, then yeah, I'll, I'll entertain the conversation with you folks about going back to school and maybe uh, you know, uh, leaving again in another semester or two. But if we beat these milestones and you know, we're clearly showing traction, then clearly it was a good decision and I've bought myself a little bit more time. And I think that's how you have to approach it is not I'm leaving and, I, and I'll never consider going back, but go ahead and set goals of you know, realistically the reason you're leaving is because you feel that you need the extra – time to invest in the business or there's some type of urgent event, a fundraising event, an accelerator, uh, you know, customers coming in and usage ramping up that you need to leave. Um, and so I would just be very clear about what your goals and intentions are and holding yourself to that because that'll only help you as an entrepreneur succeed too. Yeah, fantastic advice, man. So Jonathan, what was one of the, your bigger fears when dropping out and how did you manage that? I mean, to be honest, I feel like um, my, one of my biggest fears was pretty standard. It was just, you know, when I left, I was just ramping up into the fun part of college, right? I, I was, you know, just finished my third semester. Um, I, I was starting to have a ton of different friends in different circles, um, despite the fact that we weren't really hanging out that much because we were always working on Jevit. <laughs> um, so frankly, the biggest fear was just the the perception of of failing and having to go back and facing all of your friends and professors and peers that very publicly saw us leave school, you know? Yeah. Um, this wasn't something that people kind of wondered, hey, I wonder where those Jebit guys went. Um, I mean, everyone knew about it on campus. It was one of those things that was well documented. So um, I think that was the biggest fear, frankly, is just, you know, coming back and being known as the kid who dropped out and it didn't work out. Um, so how did I manage or adjust to that? 
Um, I just worked harder than I've ever worked in my entire life to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, and, you know, I think after that feeling was around, honestly, probably until my classmates graduated in 2015. Um, but since then, it really hasn't been too big of uh, it hasn't really ever th- crossed my mind. Now, I want to talk about the first few to six months or so right after you dropped out, because I think that that's a really crucial time. You know, you're stepping out of the system, stepping out of something that's that's the pipeline, you know, something that's tried and true. And now you're in the real world. And like you said, you just you've got to work hard. And so tell me a little bit about what what went on right after you left for those first several months. So we were a bit lucky in the sense of as soon as we left, we went immediately into this program. Um, So our days were structured. We had an office that we had to be at. We had program events. We had time to to work together as a team and collaborate. Um, And there were certain milestones as a part of the program that we were expected to uh, achieve and hit. And kind of the the whole program of Techstars and, and Y Combinator and a lot of these accelerators is on what's called Demo Day. So basically three months after you start this program where you feel like you barely have a business and a product, you're expected to pitch in front of a room of a couple hundred investors, you know, some of the biggest in the city, at a oh, wow. seed stage company. Um, and so for us, that is what dro- that's what drove everyone to work and what is required you know, 80, 100 hours a week. And, and I'm not kidding you when I say that we slept there most of the time. Um, and so I think that was a very unique experience for anyone going into an accelerator. What I would say to anyone that's just generally leaving school, how they should think about it, is the biggest um, you know, caution and, and thing I see entrepreneurs that leave school is that they lose urgency and that sense of needing to move fast and quick because they have so much more time now. When your day is, is strapped between running a business and going to school and hanging out with friends, you're constantly doing something. You're buzzing all of the time. You know? right. When you remove you know, one or two of those things, never get relaxed. And so set up some sort of structured schedule where you can go, and if you don't have an office, go to a co-working space, go to a friend's office, get you know, in coffee shops, just get out of your house so that you can, you know, you know, not lounge around all day and watch movies or get distracted on Facebook. Um, and, and again, it goes back to goal setting. Break down, you know, your business goals into month long, week long, and even on daily goals that are very tangible. So you can hold yourself accountable to: Am I ahead of schedule, or am I starting to slip behind? Uh, and I think it requires that level of self discipline, especially in the early days, because if you can show some early traction people will begin to believe in you and get in your corner and help support you. But people want to see, has this person, has this kid especially figured it out? And if you, you know, stumble out of, out of the blocks there after dropping out, um, it just becomes more difficult for you to kind of get the traction you're looking for. Right. Good word. So Jonathan, how does Jebit generate revenue right now? Let's talk about your, your current entrepreneurial journey. So right now, uh, we generate revenue in, uh, in two ways. Um, so we are a SaaS software as a service product. Mm-hmm. That basically means that customers will license our technology on an annual basis and they pay us a, a monthly fee each month. So as opposed to like an e-commerce business when, you, you know, when August 1st hits, you've done zero dollars in revenue that month. SaaS is a business where you already know what your revenue is going to be next month based on what customer contracts you have. Um, and so how we generate revenue is by selling these annual contracts. And then the second way we make revenue is we have large media partnerships, ABC, CBS, uh, Tribune, uh, et cetera, where those companies will actually take our technology and sell it to their advertisers. So let's say you're a small business mm-hmm. and you want to advertise on one of ABC's websites or one of Fox's websites. Um, you could buy content and advertising things from them and Jeb, it could be one of those things. Um, and so that's how our business is set up. I'm curious, where do you see Jebit going in the future? Do you see it going public at all? I assume that you're experiencing quite a bit of growth right now. Um, yeah, it, it has certainly been a really exciting time, not just for Jebit, but just the space that we're in, mobile technology and mobile marketing. Everyone is trying to figure out in our industry how to do this well. And there's tons of money being poured into it. Um, not to say that, you know, 
things are, are easier. <laughs> if anything, things, <laughs> the challenges are bigger at times. Right. Um, in terms of where we're going, we actually see a ton of consolidation in the industry. So what that means for, for folks listening that aren't super familiar is basically the largest companies in the space are buying medium and smaller companies to grow their offerings. So Salesforce just bought a company called Demandware that does e-commerce technology. And so now Salesforce has an e-commerce offering and Adobe is trying to buy similar companies to compete with Salesforce. Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, very active in terms of buying technologies like ours. So I would predict that any company in our space is much more likely to be acquired by a strategic buyer, whether that's a, a large enterprise software company, even a media company, some of the ones that I've mentioned, um, or you know some of the social networks or tech companies like Google or you know, you saw Yahoo being acquired by telecom companies, mm-hmm. you know, Verizon and, and Sprint and AT&T are getting very active in the space. So the good news is there, there are a lot of people that um, have an interest, it, but it will <laughs> remain to be seen um, who, who that ends up being at some point. So. so Jonathan, as an entrepreneur, life can be kind of a roller coaster of, of great times and challenging times. And so I'd love you to tell us about what you would consider to be your worst entrepreneurial moment to date. Tell us that story. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, a, a pretty sad story, so I, I don't mean to uh, to ruin it for anyone listening. Grab your you know your tissues and you know, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, but um, last last February, I mean, I can remember exactly where I was. It was Valentine's Day last February, uh, 2015. Um, I was actually in New York City with my girlfriend at the time. We had kind of set up a, a nice weekend because I never see her because I'm always working, <laughs> and so we had gone down to the city. And um, I got a call from my other co-founder, and you know, to kind of summarize the conversation and the events after that unfolded, um, his father had just committed suicide very publicly, oh, um, no. and so it was uh, kind of a very tragic, shocking event. His father and his family was like a second family to me. Um, they lived just outside of Boston, and so my family lived, you know, on the other side of the country, and so I had grown very close with with his parents and his sisters and his family. Um, and so that was a, a, it was a shell shock, but I think what was very difficult as well was not only dealing with that immediate death, um, but obviously my co-founder took extensive time off from the business as he should have to be with his family, um, which was kind of in a very volatile state for a while. Um, you know, so he's taking, you know, almost a month off, which doesn't help as, you know, a co-founder of a business. Right. And just the timing of it was, was precarious for us because we were behind on our revenue numbers by a, a healthy amount. And we were also running out of cash. You know, we had raised money a while before that, and we were supposed to be ramping up to go and raise our next venture capital round. Um, and so kind of all of those things combined, I just remember, you know, there wasn't one particular day, but just probably for a two month period of time. Um, was by far the biggest challenge that I've ever pace, faced personally and professionally um, because my co-founder is my best friend and his family was uh, extremely close to me. So um, it was very difficult to manage the expectations of uh, helping him as a friend and as a person while also trying to run the business solo and grow the company and you know get ready to raise a round of capital. So um that was certainly something that I would be happy if I never have to repeat. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet. And how did you learn and, and grow from that? What did you learn from that period of time? I think by far the most um, important thing that I learned was the importance of a really strong team. Um, I sometimes, one of my weaknesses as an entrepreneur is I sometimes will try to do things by myself if there's a lot to be done. So I'll just grab a coffee, throw myself in a conference room, or stay up late and try and you know work through it all. Right. And yeah. what I've realized, especially in those worst situations, is that you need an incredible team to come together and everyone step up because no one person can handle the load by themselves. Um, and so I think you know it's very easy to, to take for granted how incredible of a team and company you've built or or, or the people that have decided to pursue the goal of the company and mission until you're in those darkest moments. And then you're, you know, super thankful that you have (laughs) incredible people uh, surrounding you. So on the flip side of that now, what's an aha moment that you remember? A moment where something just kind of clicked and you were like, yeah, now I get it. You know, there have definitely been a few aha moments throughout the business. I think one of the first ones, uh, I'll share the story just because it's a fun story, was going back to the college days 
we decided to launch the website at a particular time. And, you know, we had a couple of brands that had signed up, but we wanted, we did, we were honestly afraid that no one was going to sign up and, and, and do it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. We, and so we wanted to build a lot of hype and buzz around it, but how do you build hype on a college campus when there's so much stuff going around, around a website that you have to answer questions for, you know? So, um, basically what we did was, you know, we, you know, did a bunch of guerrilla marketing, which basically means we went into the classrooms, we wrote on every single whiteboard on campus, we handed out flyers at tens of thousands of dorms. I mean, we had an army of students helping us out. And we launched the website at, you know, I'll never forget, 10, 11 p.m. on the 10th month of the year, uh, the 11th day, uh, October 11th. (laughs) Um, no idea why we just decided that that would be funny or cheesy. And, um, (laughs) the aha moment there when I think we finally realized that we were onto something was actually the website crashed immediately as soon as it hit, uh, 10, 11 and we went live, um, because so many thousands of students were requesting access at the same exact second as soon as it went live. Um, and so, you know, uh, the story goes, we, we got it back up within 30 minutes and we ended up you know, we only had 500 spots available. All 500 spots were, you know, f- you know, ended up being filled that night. Um, you had a certain maximum of questions each person could answer. Over 50% of people went through the entire experience. And, you know, we were actually hand delivering out the cash and rewards that night up until like 2 or 3 a.m. in people's dorm rooms. So I think that was kind of like the first moment where we were just very taken aback and realized, wow, if we could do this at a scale that wasn't just paying college kids cash, um, maybe we have something here. Um, and so that was certainly, I think, <laughs> one of the more exciting moments. I think we at the time, you know, we thought we were having our Facebook moment. It was far from it, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was still fun. So. Oh, I love it. That's a cool story, man. Um, but, but I think what's important, too, is you have to have aha moments throughout the entire journey. So obviously that was October 2011. And the most recent aha moment that's been big for our business is on weekends, uh, the four, me and my co-founder, and then the two top uh, you know, execs here that also went to BC with us, uh, they, they stayed and graduated and then they joined the company afterwards. Um, Michael, who runs our client division, and Duncan, who runs product. The four of us continue to get together on weekends and work and innovate. And um, we were faced with a really big challenge with our product recently. And we kind of had this huge aha moment uh, around mobile and, well, duh, we should, you know, do this. And, you know, it probably doesn't make sense to to listeners uh, that don't understand our product as much. But I would just encourage you to continue to be reflective and and pull your top uh, people together that are really invested in the business to reflect on what's working well and what isn't. Um, And we basically just had a really big aha moment when it came to our our product and how customers were using it. this was just three months ago, and it's made a big impact on the business already. So, Jonathan, if you could time travel back to day one of your entrepreneurial journey and have 10 minutes with your former self to communicate any lessons you've acquired with the intention of saving yourself mistakes and heartache, what would you tell yourself? I think the thing that I didn't realize early on was that everyone else in the industry was also trying to figure out digital marketing and mobile marketing along with us. So whatever industry you're in, this may be a little bit different, but um, I was very uh, intimidated early on, right? Especially because of our age. I, we were, I was 18 or 19 years old, and we were pitching customers that were 40, 45 years old. Um, and they frankly didn't give us, you know, they didn't think we had any credibility. <laughs> you know, we would come in with this new idea, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't give us the time of day. But what I realized, the more I talked to people, the more I tried to you know, teach myself things by listening to YouTube videos and going to conferences and just grabbing coffee with as many smart people as possible, yeah. I realized that, honestly, no one has figured it out, right? It's still a work in progress, and it always will be. And most industries are like that. So what I, I guess the, the advice I would give to myself is to not be afraid to put yourself out there in situations with groups that you don't feel like you belong with. But in reality, you know, be a good listener and just share your ideas um, because more likely than not, everyone is trying to answer the same questions you are. Uh, and so that would be the first thing. Um, the second thing, more tactically, because this is something that has always been a struggle for us at the company, is if you're trying to start a company and do something new, instead of pitching to customers or to investors the product or the tool that you created, you have to pitch them why 
it matters, you know? So in our instance, when we go out and pitch a customer, we don't go out and pitch them Jebit and explain what the product is to start. We have to get them to understand conceptually why interactive content matters. You know, you have to get them to that you have to get them to buy into the mission and the belief of the company, no matter what it is, even if it's uh, you know a nonprofit, especially if it's a nonprofit. Right. Um, and so I would just advise entrepreneurs as they're thinking about, you know, this applies to hiring, getting really talented employees to join you. This certainly applies to fundraising, and it applies to getting customers. Right. You have to get people to believe in your mission and understand why what they're either buying or investing in or signing up for um, really matters before you get into the weeds of our product is this and these are all the features and specs of it. No one really cares about that if they don't actually believe in the mission and purpose of the company. And so I would focus on that and share that story first. That's fantastic. Yeah, it sounds a lot like you're talking about kind of feature versus benefit of the product. And, you know, the customer is always asking, you know, whether they know it or not subconsciously, what's in it for me? And so... It sounds like that's what you're talking about, being able to communicate, you know, what's the actual benefit that they're going to get before you introduce, you know, here are, here's what the product actually looks like, how it functions, the features. Exactly. Yep. Definitely pitching benefits over features and product. Um, and then also why, why those benefits matter, you know, and, and why your solution will help get them there. So what's a personal habit that you believe contributes to your success? Um, ability to function on little sleep. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, what's been very um, helpful for me is you have to have a balanced life when it comes to staying fit, I personally believe, for entrepreneurship. Um, entrepreneurship is the ultimate sport in terms of competition, um, but at the same time, it doesn't lend itself to the healthiest of lifestyles, mm. especially today. I'm always on the road. Uh, you know, you don't always get the best food when you're, you're strapped for time. You don't have time to exercise. So the personal habit for me has actually been marathon running. It has been, let's pick something that I can do independent on my own time anywhere in the world um, and, you know, have it be extreme though so that it's something that I have to commit myself to and there's a regular goal or an event that I'm working up towards, right? Mm -hmm. um, because when I, when I just run, generally I struggle to keep the consistency. But if I know I have to run 26.2 miles in a month, you better believe I'm probably going right. to start running. <laughs> um, and so for me, that has just been very um, healthy, not only from a physical fitness standpoint, but just mentally. Being able to take a step back from the day, uh, the day to day, and, and reflecting. And, and some of my best ideas have come from when I've been on long runs. Hmm. Um, so I would really, you know, recommend everyone to to find their thing outside of work that they are passionate about, and, and you know, uh, spending time doing that. What's a quality or an attribute that you have that you would consider essential to being an entrepreneur? It's funny. We just did our management retreat with our top executives here. And as part of it, we got really transparent and honest with each other. And everyone had to go around the room and list your biggest strength and your biggest weakness. Um, and, and people were very blunt about it, which is awesome. That's what you want with your management team. There were a couple of moments you know, where you're like, ooh, I don't know. But um, So in terms of qualities... The, the common thread among anyone that was commenting on me personally um, was just the work ethic. Um, for whatever reason, it, it, it might be a disease, um, I really enjoy working and I have no problem working 20 hours a day, seven days a week. And I think that you have to have that level of dedication and desire to what you're doing to be successful um, in some industries. Um, and, and so that's you know, certainly one of the qualities that I guess has, has helped Jeb at times is, you know, having someone around that isn't afraid to kind of uh, lead by example and pull those working hours, uh, yeah. you know, as long as it's healthy. But, um, you know, that certainly allows you to get more, as I like to say, get more shit done, uh, certainly in a, in a quicker period of time. So what's a business book that you would recommend to us and why? So the funny thing is, um, so it's Creativity Inc. by Edwin Catcall, Ka uh, Catwin. Um, he is um, the current president uh, of Pixar and Disney Animation Studios. Okay. Um, but um, I actually haven't read it. But the reason I'm recommending it is because everyone in the office talks about it. Um, <laughs> all of our top employees are sharing it. Multiple copies have been bought and, they're, and they're, they continue to circulate it. So 
I'm actually in line right now to wait to get a copy. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the other book I was going to recommend was The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. He's a venture capitalist from Andreessen Horowitz, one of the top VC firms in the Valley. Um, and I've actually read that one. And that's a fantastic book about his personal journey. Mm. And, and his, the, the purpose of the book is basically most business books are focused on what you should do in a business. The problem is when you're reading those books, you've almost already made danger mistakes. Mm, yeah. So his book is focused on you're always going to make mistakes. So how do you fix them or how do you avoid bigger mistakes? Um, so I thought that was just a very practical approach. Um, but Creativity Inc. apparently is just an incredible story. So I'm actually just as excited to uh, to look into it. Awesome. I haven't read that one either. I'm going to have to check that out. We'll have a link to both of those books in the show notes too. Jonathan, what's an internet resource that you'd recommend to us? So I there's two that comes to mind. The first is Saster, S-A-A-S-T-R. And this is a blog for SaaS businesses. It's a fantastic blog. It covers everything from product to how do you split equity as founders to mm. how do you raise your first round of capital to how do you scale a company when you're 50, 100 people, etc. Um, and so it's a fantastic blog, great resources. Everyone at our company uses it because we're a SaaS business. So if you do fall into that category, I would recommend looking into that. If you don't and you're just more generally into technology and entrepreneurship, I would recommend Mark Suster, his Snapchat channel. Follow him. It's M. Suster. And what he does is basically he does snap storms. So each day he'll pick a different topic and he'll go for you know maybe five or six minutes across a bunch of different snaps in a row, kind of educating you or teaching you about a particular topic when it comes to startups or entrepreneurship, or maybe sharing his personal beliefs and opinions about an industry trend. And so that is something that very recently I've enjoyed listening to um, because it gives you access to one of the top investors in the country uh, and get their personal thoughts on how to grow a company and what you should be doing. Interesting. That's awesome. Awesome stuff, man. All right, we're down to the last two questions now here, Jonathan. What advice do you have for our listeners who are thinking of dropping out of college to pursue entrepreneurship, but they haven't quite made that step yet? I think there are three main things that I, when I was reflecting on dropping out, um, the advice that I would give. The first is around finding a purpose or an event for leaving. Um, so I, I see the, uh, I see it frequently where entrepreneurs will leave um, simply because they they want more time to work on their business and, and they think that leaving is um, the right move. And, and it certainly can be a lot of the times. Obviously, we left uh, school, but I think it, it helps you be stay more focused if it's for a particular reason or purpose. Uh, if there is an accelerator, if there is a client goal, if there is a product launch, you know, find something. Um, and, and then I guess if you're not there yet, <clears throat> that's a goal that you can strive for so that you know when you hit it, you know, you need, it's time to take your business um, or company to the next level and, and, and dropping out is the appropriate uh, thing right then. Um, and so I guess the, the point of that is um, – when you drop out, you're going to have just a lot more time, but the stakes are higher and time starts ticking. Um, and so you want to have figured out all the big questions around your business beforehand. Um, so try and figure those out before you know you, you go and just explore it for the fun of it. Um, I've already talked about you know defining goals and milestones and timeline. I think that's incredibly important. So you know as soon as you leave, set some goals in the next three months, in the next six months, a year from now. This is where I want to be, and hold yourself accountable. Great ways to do this, post it on social media, tell five of your friends and, you know, tell your parents. Um, that's the best way to hold yourself accountable as opposed to a sticky note on your laptop because uh, no one likes to disappoint people. Um, and then finally, I would say don't drop out just so you can say you're a dropout. Hmm. Um, the yeah. worst reason to get into entrepreneurship is just for the sole focus of making a lot of money and, and being famous and dropping out um, because for most of us, that will never happen and it's an incredibly hard journey. Um, so I think you have to have such a love and a passion for what you're doing um, that if you're doing it simply for the label, um, it might not be actually, you know, the best intentions uh, uh, there for you. So Right. Yep. Good stuff. What advice do you have for our listeners who have already dropped out and who are already on their entrepreneurial journey? So I think one of the things that we did well uh, early on was even though we dropped out, we didn't lose the connection with the university. 
Um, so it depends, obviously, on your situation. If you, you know, had been there for a semester, if you had been there for a few years, um, but universities are incredible centers of resources for students, right? And even alumni, they have what entrepreneurs don't have a lot of the times, which is a big network and a lot of free events to go to. <laughs> mm, and so, yeah, what good. I would do, and the advice that I would say is, even though you're u- leaving the university, don't don't leave the network of the university, use their resources. Uh, so even after we left Boston College, I technically went back at one point and just did one class on the side. It was part-time. It was once a week. It only lasted six weeks. But it was that BC Tech Trek class, and it allowed me to go to Silicon Valley and meet all the top entrepreneurs and venture capitalists at some of the biggest companies. And that was way worth it for the business. you know. And right. that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have stayed connected with the university. Um, use alumni. Alumni love talking to current students, especially students that are doing something interesting and might have dropped out to pursue a business. So use that to your advantage where you reach out to as many relevant alumni in your industry or line of business as possible because even if they can't help you, they'll likely know someone who could. Hmm. Um, and so, and there are a bunch of other examples. The Career Center, there's always a, an online portal a lot of the time with these universities to post content. LinkedIn groups, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I would really implore you to, just because you're dropping out, don't lose your connection with the university um, because some of our best customers and investors have come from actually, you know, them reading about us in a Boston College publication or meeting them through the alumni network. So, Jonathan, what's the best way that people can connect with you? Well, uh, I'm trying out this new Snapchat thing, uh, <laughs> as we were talking about earlier. Yep. Uh, just trying to be more active on it. So Jay Lacoste on Snapchat, uh, you'll find me snapping most of the time about you know, where I'm traveling that day or you know, different startup tips or advice. And um, if you're on Twitter, uh, just at Lacoste Jonathan. So just my last name, then my first name. Um, and I'm, I'm very active on that as well. So you can find me in either place. Successful Dropouts, you've been hanging out with Jonathan and Kylan, learning what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed as an entrepreneur. For everything we talked about today, head over to SuccessfulDropout.com and type Jonathan into the search bar, and the show notes will pop right up. And as always, stay hungry, stay foolish. For more information about how to drop out, grind, and succeed, go to SuccessfulDropout.com. I also love questions. If you have a question about anything we talked about today, I want to hear from you. Go to SuccessfulDropout.com and click the Ask Me a Question link at the top of the page. Successful Dropouts, if you could go to iTunes and leave a positive rating and review, it would help this show out a lot. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot going on. But if you do that, it helps this podcast rank. It helps other people listen to it and gain value just like you have been. Thank you so much in advance.